This is The World This Weekend. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Skanderis. Tonight, southern Ontario digs out after a massive storm, as some say we should be better prepared. They should be used to this. This is Canada. They should have had the plows out on the runways. Also tonight, the battle for Bakhmut. Ukrainian and Russian forces fight to control the city. It may be somewhat of a psychological victory, a morale victory, but it's really not going to make a major difference on how this war ends up. And we'll take you aboard a ship rescuing migrants at sea. I cried. I cried a lot when I saw the Geo Barents. It was as if I entered heaven. That's later, but first. It's been a day of cleaning up in parts of Ontario and Quebec after a dramatic late winter storm. The heavy, wet snow is making it hard to travel with delayed or cancelled flights and impassable roads. As Philip Lee Shannock reports, there are warnings this type of extreme weather is here to stay. In Toronto, many residents spent the day digging out under bright sunshine. Some were shocked that what was a comparatively mild winter has had extreme temperature swings. Well, we were almost putting packing everything away and getting the lawn chairs out, but nope, sorry. Wishful thinking. Out at Pearson International Airport, nearly a quarter of almost 500 scheduled flights were cancelled ahead of the storm. I've had three flights cancelled on me today, and now they've delayed my flight again till tomorrow. This woman says she doesn't understand why some airlines proactively cancelled their scheduled flights. They should be used to this. This is Canada. They should have had the plows out on the runways. It's kind of like the plows on the road. You know it's coming. Let's get out there, get the roads clean so people can get to where they need to be. Toronto is a large city. We received a lot of snow overnight. Barbara Gray is the city of Toronto's transportation manager. She declared a major snowstorm condition, prohibiting parking on routes that need to be plowed first. And she said that clearing roads after the intense 11-hour storm that dropped more than 30 centimeters of snow would take time. Sidewalks may take the longest. We have 7,400 kilometers of sidewalk that we clear. That's the distance from here to Vancouver and back effectively. It's a big, big operation. But she made no mention of plans to call in the military. In 1999, after 41 centimeters fell, the mayor of Toronto, Mel Lastman, accepted an offer of help from the Canadian forces. Today, Canadian military personnel did take advantage of the weather to conduct a full-scale exercise simulating an emergency response to a snowstorm. Brigadier General Josh Major says the training is in response to more frequent extreme weather events. We have pretty robust uh, infrastructure that, that can handle the extreme weather uh, fairly well, but we do see, uh, unfortunately, things like uh, you know, hurricanes, uh, floods, fires across the country. Stephen Flissfetter is a warning preparedness meteorologist with Environment Canada. If we get a snowfall of 15 to 20 centimeters in one day and then a rapid uh, temperature swing on the positive side, we get those rapid uh, melting and flood risks. So there have been a lot more impacts we've been seeing over the past few years because of these extreme changes. He says all Canadians and not just the military should be prepared for more common extreme weather events. Filthy Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. After more than six months of fierce combat, neither Russia nor Ukraine control Bakhmut. The eastern Ukrainian city has been nearly destroyed by Russian forces. But as Chris Reyes reports, the Ukrainian military is digging in, trying to keep its enemy at bay. In Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine, the work of keeping Russians at bay is happening trench by trench, with Ukrainian soldiers digging by hand defense lines just outside the besieged city. Months of intense fighting has come to a head, with two key bridges destroyed just in the last couple days, cutting off the city from supply and support. On Friday, a warning from the head of the Wagner Group, the private Russian army leading the advance there. Yevgeny Prigozhin released a video from Bakhmut, urging Zelensky to withdraw troops and warning him that Russian forces are closing in. Today, another video from Prigozhin, this time in front of coffins. He said, we're sending another shipment of Ukrainian army fighters home. He says they fought bravely and perished. That's why the latest truck will take them back to the motherland. General Mark Kimmett is a retired officer with the U.S. Army. 
He says the battle for Bakhmut is important, but not extremely consequential. It may be somewhat of a psychological victory, a morale victory, but it's really not going to make a major difference on how this war ends up. What will make a major difference? Resources. The U.S. has announced another round of support, $400 million worth of military equipment, including ammunition and artillery. Brigadier General Peter Zwack is a former military attache at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. This is a prestige fight, much like the fight uh, in the summer for uh, Severodonetsk and Lusuchansk. And ultimately, the Ukrainians pulled out of them, and it wasn't the end of the world. They need ammunition. Ukrainians need lots of ammunition, and that's one reason this uh, $400 million arms deal is so important. Canada has already committed more than a billion dollars in military aid for Ukraine. Today, Chief of the Defense Staff General Wayne Eyre said his visit to Kyiv was productive in checking in on how those resources are helping. Meanwhile, at the G20 meeting in India, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov mocked for his take on the war. The war uh, which uh, we are trying to stop and which was launched against us using the Ukraine, <laughs> U Ukrainian people, Ukrainian soldiers on the ground in Bakhmut say retreating is not an option, would fear that Russian forces will keep taking more cities if this one falls into their hands. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. In the U.S., at least 10 people have died as severe weather batters the south of the country and heads northeast. The mix of snow, sleet and rain has prompted the U.S. National Weather Service to warn of possible coastal flooding in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Meanwhile, in California, search crews are rescuing people in mountain communities who've been stranded for days after heavy storms dropped around three meters of snow. In Iran today, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency sat down with President Ebrahim Raisi. Rafael Grossi was in Tehran for two days of meetings with top Iranian officials. Days ago, it was revealed Iran has enriched uranium, which could be used to make nuclear weapons. Upon returning to Vienna, Grossi announced Iran will assist the UN nuclear watchdog with an investigation. For me, uh, the, the importance of today is where we are today and that I believe that uh, a marked improvement, at least in terms of my dialogue with the Iranian government, uh, has been registered. I think I was, I was heard, and I hope we will be uh, seeing results uh, soon. A joint statement from Iran and the IAEA is light on details, though Grossi said Iran will provide access to information, locations, and people for the investigation. Last week... The world was reminded of the dangers migrants face on the Mediterranean Sea. More than 60 people died, including children, when their overcrowded boat broke up near Italy's south shore. NGOs say a new Italian decree hampers their ability to help people in peril. Reporter Xavier Savard-Fournier recently spent days aboard the Geo Barents, a Doctors Without Borders rescue vessel with the support of the Quebec International Journalism Fund. He brings us this first-hand account of a dramatic rescue mission. It's late January and the Geo Barents has suddenly found itself surrounded by all platforms. That means it's close to the Libyan coast, where most migrants leave to cross the sea to Europe. Here, boats in distress are common. Sea conditions are good, visibility are good, stay calm and focus, eh? focus, okay? Go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. Ricardo Gatti is a search and rescue leader with Doctors Without Borders. Once he ends his address, two teams run in opposite directions toward the rescue boats. Ready, guys? Ready. Ready. The teams head to the scene at full throttle, but as they get closer, the smell of fuel puts them on high alert. At the epicenter of this order are 69 migrants packed on a small rubber boat, including 25 miners and a baby. We are starting actually to pass my jacket crowd control. The members on the Joe Barons often say even a normal intervention can easily go wrong. That is why they are stressed by the intense smell of fuel. The excitement of being saved, combined with the intoxication of inhaling the fumes, increases the euphoria on board. Crowd control is complicated. <laughs> And the situation was uh, was kind of 
tricky. I mean, uh, the the boat was really, really overcrowded. The situation, I think, even uh, even the people were a little bit intoxicated about the fuel smell and uh, and so on. So they were not really, really cooperative in that sense. And uh, it was embarking water. So guys. Once again, welcome on board the Joe Barents. We are very happy, very happy to have you on board. Encore une fois, merci à tous. Bienvenue. On est très heureux d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Once on board, the survivors are given food, new clothes, and blankets. And after a well-deserved shower, Abu Bakar, a 16-year-old boy from Guinea, shares his thoughts on the rescue operation. Moi, j'ai vu les équipes. Ce qui est passé, j'ai pleuré. I cried. I cried a lot when I saw the Geo Barents. It was as if I entered heaven, you know, because I have seen a lot of suffering in Libya. In defiance of the new Italian decree forcing NGOs to return to port after every rescue, the Geo Barents changed course to carry out two other interventions. When the Geo Barents finally arrived in La Spezia near Genoa, it was carrying more than 200 migrants. The authorities at the port were not impressed. At the end of the day, migrants find themselves caught in the middle of these political battles. Ted Ross fled the war in Ethiopia's Tigray region two years ago. It was his fifth crossing attempt. What happened the other time? Uh, yeah, police, uh, return back for police, Libyan police, Coast Guard. You put in the prison, uh, you pay the money, you go out. No put the money, still in the prisons. As for the Geo Barons, the police escorted the boat to port and a meeting between the authorities and the captain also took place. Meanwhile, the sea crossings are still going on. Xavier Savard Fournier, CBC News, on board of the Geo Barons on the Mediterranean Sea. At least 18 people are dead and dozens injured after a fire and explosion at a fuel storage depot in Indonesia. <laughs> One witness captured the moment of the blast, which broke out late last night in the capital, Jakarta. Thousands of people living in the area were forced out of their homes. In 2014, a fire at the same fuel depot destroyed more than 40 houses with no deaths. Officials say the government is planning to move the depot to another area of the city. And now a peek inside a covert classroom. An Afghan woman living in exile is risking her life and liberty, teaching women and girls in secret online classes. As Deanna Sumanak Johnson tells us, she's getting some help from a Canadian NGO. It's an online class in grade 7 geography that's fraught with danger. Students' cameras turned off, not by choice, but for their protection. Under the Taliban, it's illegal for girls to go to school past grade 3. Their teacher is an Afghan woman living in exile. We've altered her voice for her safety. If they know about uh, this program and if they know that they are studying still, uh, maybe if uh, the girls and also we face uh, problems. This online school is run by the NGO Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. They design the courses, translate them and make course materials available in digital format. Many Afghan families recognize that this is the way out of poverty, that you really need education to make something of yourself in the world. Vancouver-based Lauren Oates is the executive director of the organization. And even though education in, under the circumstances is also uh, risky for, for girls and women, um, many of them make the choice that it's more dangerous to, to forego an education. Her organization has been running online courses in Afghanistan for years, but the Taliban's 2021 takeover of the country made their mission more urgent. We realized immediately that this has huge potential to keep the doors to classrooms open. They're expanding their mission to also help Afghan women who had their college or university studies halted when Taliban took over. Some are still in Afghanistan awaiting asylum. Others are living in refugee camps in places like Turkey or Pakistan. Canadian universities want to help them through online courses, but many don't know where to start. It's quite a range. So one thing is um, actually accepting transfer students from unusual situations. Carolyn Waters, retired professor from Dalhousie University, is building a toolkit, strategies to help universities overcome administrative hurdles. To actually think about transferring partial degrees from Afghanistan 
uh, into a, uh, onto a Canadian transcript. You, of course, need to give them access to ESL, English as a Second Language, in some cases. It's all complicated business, with great risk to all involved, but it's worthwhile. Razia Arifi's family sent her to Canada in 2021. She now attends grade 12 at a Toronto high school. I felt that my life is not going to have any meaning if I don't go to school. Otherwise, what does it mean just to staying at home all the time, not being able to go outside or anywhere else? So... Life means nothing without freedom. She says she thinks of her friends at home with guilt and would like them to be able to study online and eventually in person. In Afghanistan, the secret grade 7 geography class talk about their dreams for the future. One girl wants to study computer science. As these girls, who can't even leave their homes in their daily lives, learn about the world they one day hope to see. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. These days, a lot of people are looking for a better work-life balance. So more and more municipalities and even companies are trying to accommodate by moving to a four-day work week. Idil Musa tells us why many say it works. We want to be seen as a dynamic and progressive employer. Employees in Algonquin Highlands now have the option of putting in longer hours in exchange for an extra day off. Mayor Liz Danielson says a compressed four-day work week and other arrangements like remote work is necessary to keep up with what employees want. Since COVID, people are looking for a different way of approaching life. Danielson says about 95% of the town's staff has opted in. She says the move has been a morale booster and it's had a minimal impact on services. The township of Zora in southwestern Ontario made the move to a four-day work week permanent in 2021. The most obvious pro is more free time and having a better work-life balance. Alicia Wetlawfer is Zora's deputy clerk. She says working longer hours over a four-day stretch speaks to the type of flexibility younger employees want. We look for more alternative work arrangements and for things that are different than the typical nine to five. Industries all over the world have started to adopt a four-day work week. Last year, 61 companies in the UK participated in a six-month trial. As a result, more than 70% of employees reported reduced levels of burnout. People reported having more satisfaction with their time. Dale Whelan in Dublin is the CEO of the nonprofit Four Day Week Global, which led the pilot. We're not advocating for a compressed working week. We're advocating for what we call the 180, 100% principle. So 100% productivity for 80% of the time for 100% of the pay. So we're reducing the working hours down to the equivalent of four days of work. Whelan argues organizations can improve their performance and productivity if efficiencies are found elsewhere, like reducing meeting times from an hour to 10 minutes. Different sectors will look at how this best works for them, depending on what sort of service that they provide. So for some people, that might mean working Monday to Thursday, from others, Tuesday to Friday, for others, reducing their working hours across a five-day period. Experts admit adopting a shorter work week will require careful planning and some sectors rethinking long-established norms. John Trugakos is a researcher with Canada's Work Time Reduction Centre of Excellence. There will be people, like with any change, that have some level of resistance to something different, um, especially something that is counter to what we've basically been doing for the last hundred plus years as an economy. Algonquin Highlands Mayor Liz Danielson. I, I think that that's something that you'll see more and more as time goes by, especially when others can see that it's working successfully. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. They were the Toronto billionaires whose grisly and mysterious murders captured the world's attention. Barry and Honey Sherman were found dead in the basement of their Toronto mansion in 2017, their necks fastened to a railing with belts. More than five years later, despite a police investigation and a multi-million dollar reward from their family, the case is still unsolved. A new CBC podcast takes a look at the theories of what happened and explores who the Shermans were. It's called The No Good, Terribly Kind, Wonderful Lives and Tragic Deaths of Barry and Honey Sherman. And it's hosted by Kathleen Goldhar, who joined us earlier to talk about it. Kathleen, this podcast is already a big success. Congratulations on that. And it's hard to find anyone who's not fascinated by this case. But what about for you specifically? Why was it important for you to create this podcast and dive into this story? Um, I guess 
the number there, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm a Torontonian, a uh, member of the Jewish community, so I have those touchstones there that brought me closer to this story. But um, there's a couple of other things that I think more journalistically I was interested in. Um, one, it's a case of a murder that happened over five years ago, and we have gotten nowhere closer to knowing what happened to these two people. And so there's a case of like, what happened to this investigation? Why did it go wrong? Did it go wrong? Another uh, curiosity I have about immense wealth. And when you make that much money, what does that do to you, to your family, to your relationships with friends and business partners? You know, how do you walk through the world when you have that much money? And what kind of an effect that money might have had on the end of their lives? We've learned a lot about Barry Sherman, how he created his fortune with the drug company Apotex. And then you also have access to his personal memoir in this podcast. Did anything you learned about him surprise you? What I found interesting about Barry Sherman, um, especially through his autobiography, was his what I have started to deem aggressive atheism. I found that really interesting. He had a really hard time understanding how anybody that he felt was a rational or uh, intellectual person could understand or believe that there was something larger than just humanity making things happen. Um, and so that that I found quite interesting. And then, so that's Barry, but there's less information, I think, about Honey. What did you learn about her? One of the most important things we found out about her was her motivation for the giving that she did. So she was most well known for her philanthropy. They gave away millions and millions of dollars in the city and in the country. You know, he obviously supported that and funded that, but it was driven really by her. And a lot of her money went to Jewish-focused causes because she was born in a displaced persons camp in Austria, and her parents were Holocaust survivors. And that never left her. She was very motivated by her background and what that did to her family and who they were, and of course, then to other Jewish people in the country. Um, and so that, to me, was an important aspect of who she was that I wanted people to know. You talked about being part of that Toronto Jewish community yourself and how tight-knit that community is. Did that add a certain degree of pressure? You know, it did. Um, not so much for me. Uh, I don't live in a Jewish community anymore. My kids don't go to Jewish schools. You know, I, I, I didn't feel it for me, although I, you know, have been sort of girding myself for a reaction. Um, I think I was more uh, concerned what would happen, you know, to my parents and how they would feel about it. But sure, I mean, you know, you have to always balance. We know this in journalism, like you can't separate who you are and where you come from. Wow. Okay. It's really fascinating. Um, obviously, a lot of attention on this case. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Kathleen Goldhar is the host of the CBC podcast, The No Good, Terribly Kind, Wonderful Lives and Tragic Deaths of Barry and Tani Sherman. You can listen to it wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to The World This Weekend on CBC Radio. I'm Stephanie Skanderis. In Peru. Some members of the LGBTQ community are putting their stamp on an American scene, ballroom culture. Much like the New York original, people compete in pageants where they are judged on glamorous outfits and dance moves. But it's also about banding together and making their voices heard in a country, Peru, where there are few safe spaces and no legal protections. Alfonso Silva Santisteban reports from Lima. Oh my God, ballroom Peru. It is literally my life. That's how Jade Shipiva, a young transgender woman from Lima, describes what ballroom means to her. In Peru, murders of trans women are a common occurrence. The law denies their identity and does not recognize same-sex couples. Violence against gender diversity comes from above and below. So youth have come up with their own way to make their presence felt the thriving ballroom community. 
Ballroom Peru es una comunidad. Ballroom Peru es una comunidad que generated from our love of ballroom culture, which identifies us. We have found in this platform a way to express ourselves artistically through Vogue, lip sync, or catwalk. Julius Prince is a founder of Lima's ballroom scene. The community usually holds balls in small art spaces, bars, or even squares. Balls are organized around houses, which are collectives. People compete in pageants with categories such as face, folk, or American runway following the New York tradition. But on the most recent World AIDS Day, Ballroom Peru took a much more glamorous stage, transforming the chessboard floor of Lima's Museum of Art into a runway where participants competed. It has been something that has brought us together. It has generated community awareness, and for now, it is even generating job opportunities for us. About 50 to 70 people are normally in the crowd. The Lasso's Balls audience was double the usual number. During a break in the ball, Camila Perez sits on the floor of the dressing room between standing mirrors and suitcase filled with shiny dresses. She's been a part of the community documenting balls since its early days in 2019. There was only one house, and today there are five, six, seven houses. Perez says ballroom helped her to come to terms with traumatic experiences in her own life. When I arrived here, I had a great conflict with my femininity. And now that we inhabit this space, I began to free myself a little more, right? I had an episode of sexual violence, which caused me to be very restrictive with myself. And being here with so many queer people, you begin to let go, and I think it has even been like a therapeutic process. Discrimination and violence can be part of everyday life for queer and trans youth in Lima. So ballroom participants dance to resist. Flavia Rios, a young transgender woman from Lima, sums it up best. We live in a society that still doesn't guarantee all of our rights, and ballroom is the place where you can live the fantasy, where you can be yourself, where you can shine like you've always wanted to. And that is more than a fight, it's about being happy. That was freelance reporter Alfonso Silva Santisteban in Lima, Peru. The word on every Torontonian's lips today? Make that thunder snow. That intense southern Ontario storm we told you about earlier featured a truly bizarre phenomenon. The gobs of heavy snow accompanied by flashes of light, followed by... It had everyone talking and basically all saying the same thing. Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening me. Some might say there was only one possible explanation for this meteorological melange. It was the work of the Norse god of thunder, Thor. Not quite, says Environment Canada's senior climatologist Dave Phillips, who explains it's similar to a storm you'd expect in July. Essentially, the atmosphere is uh, charged with moisture and lots of dynamics. The air is rising, and as air rises, it cools, and lots of action goes on inside those clouds, uh, including thunder and, and lightning. It's more of an oddity, a curiosity. It doesn't really mean very much uh, other than tells you the state of the atmosphere, and you're probably going to get a lot of snow in this particular case. And hey, that's exactly what we, uh, what we saw. All right, so maybe it wasn't Thor. But as the massive task of cleaning up continues, you might say we've been a bit... You've been listening to The World This Weekend. I'm Stephanie Skanderis. Good night.